you all know and we all know that you know, our activities as human beings uh, have been changed totally as a result of our space exploration and how we understand the universe and how we know and live our lives is, is really a lot to be said about the space program over the years. And science has provided us with incredible understanding of how we fit into our planet, the world that we live in, and as we all know, computing uh, makes life as we know it possible. Uh, and as you all know, computing had a lot to do with helping put a, a man, a person in space. So whether it's our navigation in our daily cars or predicting the weather, which we've been able to uh, suffer with here in the Bay Area for the last little while, a little bit hotter than usual, but that, that happens now and then. So our, our exploration in space um, and the role that computing played is as important as rocketry. So tonight's conversation is going to be about software and space, and we'll look forward to that. So as we enter the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 7 moon landing, uh, we want to present this program tonight with a distinguished panel, and I want to introduce them right now. Dan Likely, who played key roles in the development of the software for the Apollo computer guidance systems. Matt Schindel is a historian of space and of space history, and he's a curator at the National Air and Space Museum. And Charles Simone, someone I'm pleased to call a friend I've known for some time, legendary programmer uh, at Microsoft in the very beginning, but also now back at Microsoft working on some exciting new projects. Um, and as you all know, and I'm sure you've looked at the program, he's had the pleasure and the opportunity to be in space as a tourist more than once. So uh, he lived the dream that we all raised our hand to experience. So Charles, I'm sure you'll share a little bit about that tonight. And then last, but by no means least, our, our key in-house uh, curator of the Microsoft, excuse me, the uh, Museum Software History Center, David Brock, will be leading the panel tonight. So let me welcome them all four to the stage. So thanks and welcome. Great. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, I thought we could begin our conversation with uh, talking with Dan for a few minutes. Um, uh, going back to um, the Apollo era and exploring a little bit the connections between computing and the whole story of Apollo. So Dan, could you tell us a little bit about what the Apollo guidance computer is and the part it played in the Apollo missions? What did it do? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was the main, uh, the main thing that it computed, it computed every, every phase of the mission, and the astronauts got at the keyboard, of which someone just showed me. <laughs> it was a very primitive keyboard because it was a long time ago, and everything was quite primitive. The Apollo, I got into Apollo uh, only because I was on a submarine. <laughs> I worked starting uh, soon after I got out of college. I actually spent another year getting a master's, and I started working on the Polaris guidance system, which was even more primitive than the Apollo. We had little, each little module had transistors and resistors and so on, and then you put it onto a printed circuit board. And I really worked on the hardware in those days. Then I got told I was going to ride a submarine, the uh, George Washington SSBN 598, which was the first Polaris submarine. And we went all over, ended up in Holy Lock, and I was gone for several months. We were submerged for 63 days, which, uh, by the way, when I talk about it, more people are interested in my experience in a submarine than they are interested in Apollo. <laughs> they all say, tell me more. <laughs> and I, it, it was amazing that I got through all of it. And when I got back, I was working at what is now the Draper Lab. It was called the Instrumentation Lab. And I got back in May of 61. I left in February. And I, my old job was sort of gone. And they said, we got this new thing coming. NASA has given us a little bit of money, early money, so you'll be one of four or five. Are you interested in the reentry? I said, what's reentry? <laughs> and so I started working on it in May of 61. We got our contract in August of 61. 
and we've been working on it ever since. And uh, I hired this Ray Morth, who also was from MIT, and then Bard later, and we we had a lot of work, and we were in pretty good shape by uh, June of '63. We had basic stuff done. It looks like Fortran. We thought we had it all lined up. Although they brought the Block 2 system out, and then we had to add the autopilot. In Block 1, you just told North American's control system what angle to turn it to. And on Block 2, you had to turn jets on and off. So mm. another friend did the autopilot. So we wanted a certain bank angle. And to do it, he had to measure off of our inertial system what the, uh, what the bank angle and where we were relative, and he had all the information. It's what they called the state vector. And the state vector was your position and velocity and time. So if you knew all of that, you could extrapolate, you knew a lot more, where, know where you were going to go. Now, the Apollo computer was so slow that the state vector could only, the, the basic cycle took two seconds to get through to compute everything that needed to be done. Some of it was slow because there, it was small and there wasn't much else you could do. Um, the, the computer was 15,000 words of fixed memory and 1,000 words of erasable. And these <laughs> words were 15 bits. They're hardly real words. So all the scientific calculations had to be done in what we call double precision, double add, double subtract. But it wasn't really double precision. It was two of these 15 bits with a hook together, but you couldn't do very limited things with it because you didn't have floating point. So it was all fixed, uh, fixed point propagation. And their fixed point, which really is only important for multiply, was all set up as a fraction. So it was a lot of work. We had it done and where we thought on like a, on a compiler, like a Fortran, but it wasn't. We had our thing all worked out. And uh, actually, I can show. I won't do the first one, probably. Which one is do it? Do you want to call up the slides, Dan? Did, before, before we turn to your slides, may I ask you um, to talk a little bit for people who might not be as familiar with it? Um, to just talk about the importance of re-entry, um, what was at stake, what the, what the com and what the computer had to do to make that successful. There are several things important about the re-entry. One was you had no communication with the ground. You were totally on your own because of the, uh, it was enveloped by the, uh, the speed that you were hitting the atmosphere created this thing around you that it made it impossible to send radio waves mm -hmm. back and forth. So it had to be totally self-contained. And the other is, all the other phases of the mission use uh, rocket engines or jets to turn it and to power it. Reentry, there was no fuel left. You were coming home with an empty engine. Oh my gosh. So what you could, you could actually turn the jets a little. But the way it slowed down, you're coming back when you're coming back from the moon at 36,000 feet per second. I always have trouble with units. <laughs> <laughs> what is escape speed? Nowadays, everything's in meters, but I predate all of that. Yeah. And so you've got a huge hot item that's going to hit the atmosphere and it is going to get really hot because the way that it happens, that surface, the big blunt surface, by the way, uh, friends at AFCO had a lot to do with building that surface, but I don't know much about it. It was ablating material is the phrase they talk about. So it would burn off and get very, very hot. And the astronauts inside the reentry vehicle had to be, had to be protected from all of that. That's why there was a very thick thing between them. The uh, other thing that on the reentry that we talked about before, actually we hadn't been talking about it tonight, but you asked about where I worried about Apollo 7. 
Not really at all. We had, I was a rope mother, which is the one in charge of making sure our rope, which is what they call the fixed memory, because it was done in a, a rope around cores. And uh, for Apollo, what ended up, we called it AS-501 and 502. They were unmanned. They ended up being Apollo 4 and Apollo 6. But they went out, they left orbit with a, and went up and then came, turned around and powered back in. To, to, on the first one, 501, it hit the re same speed as if you would come back from the moon, which mm -hmm. is, again, the, the uh, 36,000 roughly. The second one had some problems, didn't quite get that fast, but both of them really tested the heat shield. But the reentry worked fine on those. So by the time it got to Apollo 7, which was just coming in from orbit, there wasn't much worries at all. Orbit, you just <coughs> put the lift vector up and coast right into the atmosphere because below orbital speed, it's, it's stable. If you just put the lift vector up and hit, and at orbital speed, orbital speed is when V squared over R equals G. We got enough geeks there to <laughs> know what that means? That there, that's why you can stay in orbit if your velocity divided by the radius where you are equals to the g, g. And then, then you're in a nice stable orbit. But if you start losing velocity, you'll come in. But if the lift vector is pointed upwards and you hit the atmosphere and you need it in order to, uh, because you're losing speed. So, and what happens with suborbital if you come in using the lift vector and you come up a little bit, you get less lift and you fall back. If you get into deeper into the atmosphere, you get more lift and it'll bring you back. So what, you're, what we had programmed it to follow is called the equilibrium glide curve. Mm -hmm. That's a thing where all the forces are equal, you're in equilibrium and you just sort of coast down and land. If you're coming in from orbit with a vehicle like that, like they did in Apollo 7, there's no worry, there isn't anything they could really do that they wouldn't come back all right. If you're coming back from the, at, the, or at the lunar return velocity, it's entirely different. Above orbital speed, it's statically unstable. <laughs> that means you need a lift vector down to stay in the, on the orbit that you want, above orbital, uh, stay on the path, trajectory you're on. You hit this atmosphere and you gotta dig in with a lift vector into the atmosphere. Now the trouble is, if you go in deeper, you get more and more lift, which sends you in more. Oh my God. And if you're too high, you lose enough, and then you hop out and go on some coast and come around again an hour or two later. So it's statically unstable, and you have to make sure you make all your corrections at the right point and the right time. That's what the onboard computer did. It computed okay. all of these, told it, rolled, banked the vehicle from one side. You had to worry about your lateral, so you sort of snaked in. And to do that, you, you, every once in a while, you switch from the left vector on one side to the left vector on the other. And that's how. <laughs> well, now, did that long enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, it sounds like that by the time there were manned missions, you know, th where your reentry program, you know, kind of had their life in its hands, um, that it had been well tested, uh, certainly through um, these unmanned flights and also well tested before anything ever flew. Could you talk a little bit about just the, the general program in the instrumentation laboratory to develop the software? Um, what sort of challenges you faced? Uh, and just paint a picture for us of kind of the the scale of the effort for, for doing this um, very important job? Well, the engineering effort wasn't so bad. Uh, three of us had the whole thing for the reentry engineered and the equations, which are in one of these things. Would you like me to go to the slides, Dan? Sure, let's go to the slides. You can skip over the, that's, skip over the next one. That's okay. just the, the name of the report. Those are the three of us that are listed there. Myself, Ray Morth, and Bard Crawford. We were all at MIT, and Bard and I were in the aero department. And there you can see the summary. I don't think anyone could read it <laughs> besides me, but, but do it. And, and then what we, this, if you date, you see that that is June of 1963. And here is the basic block diagram. 
And this looked like, I thought we were done in 63. And the thing is, we had just run it with a, like a Fortran, it was actually a different compiler, and with floating point, with regular Fortran-like programming, I didn't realize what a big effort it was going <laughs> to be to convert something that worked fine on our big general purpose computers onto the AGC. The biggest thing that I complained about, there was no floating point, so you, you had to get everything scaled properly, and if you made a mistake, in fact, at one thing I wrote a memo that said, after we'd made errors a few times, if we don't get to the moon, I know what's gonna happen. We're gonna end up halfway or twice as far. <laughs> <laughs> because everything was scaled by factors of two, and if you got the wrong scaling, you'd be off by a factor of two in some direction. Well, um, we'll be, we're gonna turn to um, talking about uh, Apollo 11 and its significance and, and everybody's reactions to it. Uh, later in the program, um, Good. but um, I thought now we could maybe shift and um, talk to you, Charles, about your direct experiences as a as a space tourist. Um, you know, people are probably most likely to know about your achievements in programming and software, like developing the word processor Bravo at Xerox PARC, and leading Microsoft's push into application software, like Excel and Word. But they may be surprised to learn that you are the first two-time space tourist. I was very curious if you could tell us about how your passion for space developed. How did it start? So. Um, let me paint, paint the picture. It's 1963. I live in Hungary. It's behind the Iron Curtain at that time, and in a, in a communist country. And um, I was very interested in, in space, and, and the only problem was that I, I couldn't find any information uh, from, from Russian sources. It was very meager, and I didn't have access to, to Western uh, uh, papers. Or, or publications. But I learned a lot about, about science, and, and in fact, I started to learn English just to, um, to, because of my interest in, in rockets. I mm. never thought that of myself as going to space. That was really unthinkable. I was, I was just wanted to know the, the least amount mm. that, that you could get about, about the diameter and the propellants and, and, and so on and so forth. By the way, that was one of my first words in English, propellant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know, there was also bifurcating, I think. But anyway, uh, so um, anyway, I, I won this. Uh, there was this TV quiz among the communist satellites, no pun intended, <laughs> where they would choose the best kid in every country, kind of a junior astronaut, and bring them to Moscow. Because those were the heydays of space for the for the for the Soviet bloc. Mm. Uh, uh, this was Khrushchev was still in power, and he based his his prestige basically on the on the uh, success of, uh, of the Russian space achievements. And the, the idea was that we may not be able to we Russians, or we Soviets. We may not be able to do washing machines, but we can do something that is much harder, yeah. which is space. <laughs> and so the washing machines will come later. <laughs> so anyway, I, I won. And I was Hungary's junior astronaut, and I was sent to Moscow. There was no competition in, uh, in Moscow because they would have to fix it to, for the Russians to win. <laughs> um, there was no competition, but we met Pavel Popovich. Hmm who was number four, those who keep track of, of the, in, the, in the Russian mm. order. And, and I met him personally. He gave me a, a signed postcard. And uh, Gagarin, of course, couldn't make it. But, uh, but he sent an, a, a nice uh, book, a signed book. And, and so did Chitov. And so I still have them in my library. And I kept the postcard. And I took it with me to the space station. Huh. And had it stamped on the space station, brought it back, <laughs> and and there I was at the receptions, uh, reception in, in Star City. I was the most junior um, cosmonaut you can imagine, uh, and a tourist uh, to boot. <laughs> and there was Popovich, who was 
the senior surviving cosmonaut mm -hmm. because Gagarin, of course, Titov, Nikolaev passed away. Uh, before which passed away the year after, before my second flight. But I met him, and he pretended to recognize me. <laughs> uh, I think he was briefed. He was very, very kind and, and embraced me. Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> so it was very, it was very touching reunion. How old were you when you won that contest? About twelve. Twelve. Yeah. 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 That was before. Wow. Sorry, at, at the first visit to Moscow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a kid show, right? Right. And the questions were very simple, you know. <laughs> is Pluto a planet? It's, 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 it's. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so, how did? Could you could you tell us a little bit about how your engagement with or fascination with space um, continued up until the time that this opportunity arose to be a space tourist? Well, I was very lucky, and I was able to leave Hungary, and, and I was in Berkeley at Apollo 11, okay. and looking at it at a rented color TV um, uh, that I rented just for that week. Mm. Uh, and, um, and it, of course, it, it left a deep impression on me and this, everybody else around, around me. But I was really interested in computers uh, much more, and, and I kind of neglected space. And this notion of, of, of um, being able to fly to space as a tourist, that came out of the blue in, in the early 2000s, thanks to an entrepreneur, um, um, uh, uh, Eric Anderson. <laughs> Hi, Eric. Um, uh, Eric Anderson organized, recognized that the, the Russian space agency needed dollars, interestingly right. enough. They were under pressure to be more self-sufficient. Mm. and. Um, and the, the U.S. Uh, NASA was, was, was f become friendly to this idea. It wasn't initially friendly, but it became friendly because there was a difficulty in supporting the Russians with dollars mm. officially due to some legislation, the Iran, the Iran non-proliferation legislation. Huh. So it was, um, they found that it was fairly convenient to, to transfer these dollars through by allowing or supporting tourism. So I had a, a complete access. I, had, I visited Houston, got, got safety training in Houston for the, for the American segment. I was, um, uh, anyway, it was, a, it, 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 worked. it was amazing that it happened. Uh, Star City is a, a, a very Spartan place. Mm -hmm. uh, they were using uh, um, torn up drawings for in, the, in the toilets. And it was just toward the end of my, my um, training that I found uh, paper, uh, toilet paper in the toilets. <laughs> and I said, they must have cashed the check finally. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was a, it, it was a, a mutually beneficial, uh, when I'm talking about the whole thing now, seriously, a, huh. a, a very beneficial arrangement where uh, uh, the, the NASA could support indirectly the Russian space effort to be much needed uh, foreign currency. Now this is, of course, a, a temporary thing, and, right. and that's why I went twice to, to, because the window was still open. Could you paint a picture for us about um, the, the training programs that you underwent for, for those two missions on the two flew? Absolutely. So, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick, uh, but uh, the training program was maybe one-third uh, Russian language. I, I chose to do that so that I understand the details of the flight, because on, the, on, the, on board of Soyuz, everything is in Russian. Right. And on board of on, on Space Station, there are two official languages. So uh, one-third Russian, one-third physical activity that includes all the medical stuff that is, that is can be fairly nasty. And, um, and then one third was, was theory. Mm. And I, uh, from the theory, I want to show you just a, a, a few slides that have to do with computers. Um, this is the, the cosmonauts console that is right in front of, for, right in front of you. Have you. Has anybody seen the, the movie Gravity? Mm. Yes. Yeah, if you haven't, you should see it. Um, and if you have, you should see it again. If you are interested in the details, forget about the story. 
but the, the, the details are very accurate. Mm. And for example, this panel is, is, is depicted very accurately. You see an analog scale there. By the way, I'm sitting on the right side of, of this, so I don't have a screen of my own. The commander sits in the middle, and, and the flight engineer is on the left. Mm. The, um, uh, we could talk about this for hours, but I just wanted to show you a, a checklist and in, in Russian that we follow. And, and you will notice that, that this is the, the, uh, the con conservation of, of the spacecraft after you arrive to the space station, turning everything off. <laughs> and it, and it uh, directs you at the bottom of the screen. You see those lights. It says uh, in Russian, check the light being off or on. And it, and it, it has a coordinate in terms of a Russian letter and a number. And these coordinates refer to one of the screens, the most important screen called KCD, which is at the bottom of, 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 your, of your picture. And notice that this is a simulation of an earlier spacecraft that had physical buttons labeled exactly the same. And they wanted to keep uh, the training material and, and, and all the documentation uh, the same, mm. so they created a emulator uh, a, a, emulator that run on Unix and runs on a, on a, on a 386 chip. <laughs> they like the older chips because of the radiation resistance and a mm. larger feature size. Anyway, so those are, those are the buttons, and, and there are rows and columns. And you use cursor to move a cursor over a button, and then use another button to push the virtual button. And this can be taken. These are other uh, 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 analog gauges that, that used to be there, and now they are, they are course, virtual. But this is interesting. This is a display uh, that it has the unfortunate name Pervy. And um, <laughs> this is the direct interface to the Argon 16 computer, which is the equivalent of what Dan had been talking about, the, uh, the um, Apollo guidance computer. Right. About, the, about half the performance and double the, double the weight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it's, but to be sure, it's triply redundant. Uh, you had parity, but this machine is triply redundant and it never, never failed. Of course, it's a later, somewhat later technology, but not much. But if you notice in this one, on the, on the right side, there are these uh, little uh, windows which are uh, numbers that you would type in by pushing the virtual number buttons below it. So you the cursor keys to go to a virtual button two and then push the, 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 the entry button that is virtual using the real key to enter a number there, and that becomes a new uh, portion of the state vector. Yeah. By the way, those who read octal, you can, you can read that octal number vertically, and you can see the bits as they are developed from that octal number that turn on the different, different things. But you can see that even as the, as the technology changes, um, they want to keep everything, the, the, you know, as many things the same as possible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, w one, one final question about this experience, if I could, um, which is that you know, uh, at, at other times, we've talked about your particular experience in computing and that when you began with computers, you were on sort of the, the very first generation of mainframes. And, and in your career, you had kind of uh, gone through all and helped create successive generations of computing. Could you connect that experience from kind of having worked on every generation of computing to, to experiencing this system? Was this kind of a return to the past or? Well, uh, it, absolutely. I, I think that, that when we are looking at the performance of, of performances of, of these machines, there's this kind of performance that tends to reappear. The, uh, the giant machines of the first generation uh, we're doing about 20,000 instructions per second, but fairly big word length. And then the, uh, these uh, space computers, they, uh, they have about the same, same performance. Uh, maybe the, the lack of floating point, of course, was a problem. Uh, and then remember that the first personal computers, mm -hmm. uh, Apple, for example, the Apple II, the chips, the 88, well, uh, even the 6502 and the 8080 chips, had again the same performance. Hmm. So it's good to, to know these performance uh, characteristics or be familiar with them. 
to jump onto the next next stage. Now we, of course, we are facing completely different problems, which is which is a new challenge. <laughs> but it's it's good to see that, but it's interesting to see rather, to see that this kind of uh, performance um, range reappeared hmm. um, uh, several times in history. And I was very lucky in going through a kind of time warp where I experienced it uh, in a fairly condensed way. Thank you. Um, Matt, I'd like to turn to you if we could. And, and, and could we ask you to help us put the experiences that um, Dan and Charles have just described into, into a broad context? You know, how do you see the relationship between computing and human exploration of space? Sure. Um, I don't know anything about floating points, so I can't talk about that. <laughs> but um, what I can say is, you know, when we talk about the history of space exploration, and especially about, you know, imagining how humans might live and work in space, we often go back, you know, earlier than the launch of the first artificial satellite, we go back oftentimes um, to the early 50s, to more sort of popular culture uh, imaginations of, of what space exploration would look like, and in particular to this series of, of um, issues of Collier's magazine that came out in the early 50s mm. talking about man's future in space. Um, and uh, when you look at how it was imagined at that point, um, humans were going to be necessary for every activity in space. Nobody could really imagine, based on the computers that were available at the time, which were, you know, we were before this in, in the reception, there was a large picture of the UNIVAC computer, and, yeah. and that was the type of computer that people were familiar with. It was, you know, it would take up a whole room in order to house one computer, and it was mainly used for research purposes. Nobody was really uh, thinking about these. Well, they may have been thinking about it, but nobody had yet figured out how to use a computer to control a very complicated system like you would need for a spacecraft, uh, for a communication satellite. So when you look at some of the illustrations that were in these Collier's magazines, uh, what you see is, you know, for example, in the communication satellite, you see the equivalent of a telephone switchboard from an office building with actual wow. human astronauts up there making the connections, right? It wasn't computer controlled. Um, and when you see, you know, uh, plans or, or illustrations of what would be something like what has become the Hubble Space Telescope, that was a manned observatory, mm. you know, as it was imagined in the 50s. Because among other things, you couldn't imagine um, that a computer would be able to take digital images and that it would be able to change a canister of film if it was using you know, actual regular film. So humans were going to be very necessary for every single activity in space as it was first imagined. Hmm. But when we jump forward to the 1960s um, and we think about how space began to be imagined at that point, computers, of course, had really changed, right? The integrated circuit comes uh, into being in the 60s, and computers start to get smaller, start to get more powerful, um, and the work that Dan did on Apollo becomes more possible, um, and you start to be able to imagine computers doing more in space. So, like the the piece of popular culture that I could point to there is, you know, we were talking before this again about 1968, um, 2001 comes out, and uh, Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke are able to imagine you know, an artificially intelligent computer that's actually able to operate an entire spacecraft. Although they're still putting humans in a lot of uh, different roles in, in the different spacecraft that they show in the different space stations, um, computers are doing a lot more. And, you know, really, I think if you look at the history of NASA and the history of the computer industry, they really grow up alongside each other. Hmm. And so space exploration, both human and robotic, especially robotic, has really benefited from all of the progress that's been made in computing and in the miniaturization of computer technologies and hardware, uh, development of, of uh, technologies like the CCD that allows for um, you know, capture of images without any kind of television uh, apparatus or, um, or film. You know, these, these things have really made us capable of doing a lot more in space than we were when we first entered space. Mm. Do you see consistent themes, um, you know, in this connection of uh, the history of computing to space history? I mean, you've mentioned some of the trends, obviously, but are there um, are there any other consistent 
you know, is there a consistent story about that relationship, I guess, is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, I, I think there's um, a somewhat consistent story, right? Like, um, if you look at a, a research center like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where they really have integrated software development and computer development into what they do in building spacecraft, you can see that it's gone sort of hand in glove with the, the, um, the work of exploring space. And having that existing relationship to Caltech as well has helped. You know, having um, university research being done on computer science and, and having that feed into the space program. I think what you see is um, there have been times when NASA has pushed the development of computing when it's had a very specific need. But on the whole, what you see is a space program that's just really benefited from how integrated computers and um, you know, smartphones, other things that rely on computer technology, how integrated those things have become into our own lives, mm. right? And how that has really pushed the movement for miniaturization of technology and for more powerful, smaller processors, et cetera. Um, so that, I think, is the theme, is that um, space exploration, especially the type that I specialize in, which is robotic exploration of the planets, has really benefited incredibly from um, you know, the way that we live on this planet and the way that we now rely so much on computer technology. I have been impressed in the ways in which, um, you know, for some of these planetary um, missions, um, they're so long term. Yeah. You know, there's this question of, you know, maintaining this software and maintaining the spacecraft and, you mm -hmm. know, having a reliable computer for, you know, tens of years, decades. Is that one of the special kind of needs that the space program has that kind of pushes on computing technology? In some ways, yeah. I mean, um, like going back to the earliest uh, robotic missions, if you can even call them robotic, they were sort of proto-robotic, like um, thinking about the, the Ranger missions to the moon, mm. which were crash, crash landings on the moon. You could say that those spacecraft actually didn't really even have a computer on board. They had a sequencer on board that controlled everything that they did. And because it's only a fraction of a second of um, you know, sending a signal to the spacecraft that's at the moon uh, from the Earth, you can almost real time control that spacecraft from ground control, right? Right. So um, with those early robotic missions from Ranger, then to Surveyor, then to Lunar Orbiter, um, they didn't need incredibly powerful computers in, in order to run those missions. Um, but if you look at the missions that are running now, uh, that run for long periods of time and that go very far away from the Earth, where you know if, if you're on a Mars mission, um, you know it can be as much as you know it can be as short as an eight-minute time delay, but it can be much more than that, depending on where Mars is compared to Earth in their relative orbits. So you really need a spacecraft that can take care of itself, and that means having a robust computer and an operating system that can make a lot of decisions for itself, and that can also you know you can upload new commands on a daily basis based on what you've received the night before, because you have to kind of plan everything out ahead of time and send all of the, mm. the detailed commands for the rover's daily activities. And then if you think about going even further out than that, like the Voyager spacecraft, when it visited the outer planets, you're talking about hours of time delay. And um, you know that just becomes incredibly difficult to do if you don't have a good computer. Um, but as you said, you know, one of these issues is these, these spacecraft are traveling not only far away, but for long periods of time, right? Getting Voyager launched in, in uh, 77, and it, it didn't reach its final planetary en encounter uh, until 89, right? So that is a long period of time that you have to keep a computer and software running. And that does mean that you have to, in some ways, freeze your technology. Mm. And oftentimes, this happens a few years before the mission even launches. You have to know what your computer is going to be and what your operating system is going to be. And you have to have computers back on Earth that don't get any upgrades uh -huh. uh, in the meantime so that you can still emulate what's going on on that spacecraft and know that your you know, software package that you're about to send up to it is not going to crash it. Right. right. Um, last question kind of in this vein. Do you have a, a favorite or, or ready example of ways in which kind of the developments in computing driven by, let's say, um, 
mainstream commercial concerns have really played into these uh, planetary missions in a way that you know we might not know. You know, do you have a mm. favorite example of that sort of um, commercial technology playing a role in these planetary missions or robotic missions? Yeah, well, um, <coughs> I have one example that's related to something that um, I was also doing here this week in Mountain View, which I was over at NASA Ames um, working on collecting uh, one of the, the, the test bed um, technology demonstrators that they built to prove that the, the concept for the um, Kepler Space Telescope would work, that you could actually detect the very small changes in light emitted from a star when a planet transits in front of it, which is a 10 parts per million um, change in light, which mm. is incredibly difficult to detect. And um, when the PI for that mission, Bill Baruki, first proposed it to NASA, NASA said, no, you can never do it. Um, you're proposing this uh, through the Discovery Mission Channel, which is basically Discovery Missions at NASA are the lower cost missions that are supposed to use already developed technologies, uh, as opposed to like the flagship missions that can cost you know, several million dollars or even a billion or more dollars. So um, when, when Bill Baruki proposed this, he said, I can, I can do this with off-the-shelf CCD technology. Hmm. And NASA didn't believe him, so he built this um, technology demonstrator where he was able to simulate the conditions of space in which the CCD would be operating and showed that it could, in fact, detect these small changes in light and that it could do it regularly and accurately. Um, and, and so th I think that's a great example. You know, the CCD was not developed for use in space, but it's become in incredibly um, you know, ubiquitous in, in almost every spacecraft. Almost every imaging system that's out there uses these CCDs. Mm. And just in the improvements that have been made in that technology for non-space related reasons, they're able to you know, be used as very sensitive light photometers like what uh, Bill Baruki needed for that mission. So you know, I think that that's an, a, a very good example of this. And another that's not quite as computing related, but um, you, know, you may have followed the, uh, the Juno mission that's at Jupiter right now. It's the first mission that we've sent out into the outer solar system that's used solar power rather than um, you know, the, the radioactive uh, isotope thermo thermo thermal generator. Sorry, I always stumble over that. <laughs> it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, RTG for short. That's much easier to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the fact that they were able to do that mission with solar technology is not because NASA developed new so solar technology. It's because you know, us here on Earth have been pushing for newer, better, more efficient solar cells mm. um, for our own lifestyles and for creation of clean energy, right? And so, you know, that mission really benefited from, from what's being developed here for non-space related purposes. Thank you. Well, I'd like if I could to, to uh, open up the line of questioning now to, to address it to all three of you at, at the same time. Um, as uh, Daniel mentioned at the top, we're rapidly approaching the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, a pivotal moment in both human history and space history. I wondered if each of you could tell us your thoughts about what you think is most important about that moon landing. So whomever might want to tackle that first, please do. Well, <laughs> um, well the uh, um, received wisdom is correct. It's a, it's a giant leap for mankind, but I'd like to put my own twist on it, that the, uh, the significance to me wasn't the, the reach, the, this particular first. I think that, that there are many firsts. You were kindly mentioning, I am a first in being the first to go as a tourist going twice. Um, and I think that if you would ask a, a Russian, they would say, well, Gagarin mm. is, the, is the significant step because that's the first time that humans uh, broke the, the chains of gravity and mm. so on. So, but what I think is incredibly important about Apollo 11 is that it fulfilled um, uh, President Kennedy's um, uh, promise, which was, the, uh, the goal was to go to the moon and, and bring somebody back safely. But what the, uh, the purpose 
That was to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Hmm. So remember that, organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Hmm. And, and that was accomplished. Hmm. And we are, that's what we are benefiting from now. Uh, we are not benef benefiting from Apollo 14 and 15 and, and 16 and so on. But, but the best of our energies and skills paid off in, in ways that wasn't, nobody predicted it. This uh, business about how chips were developed for, for Polaris and Apollo, that's partially true. Those chips were developed to be, uh, to be lightweight, uh, low power, and reliable. Mm -hmm. They weren't developed to be cheap. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that the more expensive, the better. <laughs> um, uh, and, it, and, and it was. And nobody could foresee how the cost curve would, would come down. But it was inevitable. Uh, people had doubts about it. Uh, I, I understand now from people who look back in the Kennedy era, and, and they write that Kennedy had doubts about mm -hmm. that they, they went on this wild goose chase um, that is not going to pay the bills and so on mm. with all the other problems. And, and of course, uh, Nixon was, was, was very much upset about the whole thing. I, in my collection, I have a set of slides that was, was Werner, Werner from Brown, mm. Saint in German, Werner from Brown, <laughs> Uh, was trying to present to the president right after the, the high of the Apollo 11 landing, 50 years ago, exactly. He never got near Nixon. Uh, I, the, I think that he, he, he actually presented it to Rogers, who was the, the um, uh, Secretary of State. And this set of slides described a mission to Mars Huh. to be accomplished by, I think 79 was the landing date or, or, or something like that, was plotting out the, the percent of, of, of GMP that would be, would mm. be spent and, and so on to great precision and quite doable, frankly, mm. except for the, uh, the, 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 the taking, taking the GMP. <laughs> um, I mean, politically, it was completely uh, a non-starter. Non, non Anyway, the, 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 the mission was accomplished at Apollo 11, and everything was kind of coming, coming down, maybe rightly so, mm. after that. But our best of our energies and skills were measured and what was it? Uh, organized yeah. and measured. Yeah. Matt, do you have any thoughts about that? Sure. Um, well, in defense of, of the later Apollo missions, um, I, I think you're right that Apollo 11 was the most significant, but um, you know, from my standpoint, coming out of the history of science, uh, those later missions were really uh, valuable in all of the geology that actually got done on the moon by humans. And it's really the only example that we have of how humans explore another world versus robots. Hmm. Um, and we brought back, you know, I think 800 and some pounds of, of lunar rocks and soil. And uh, those rocks and soil have been an incredible source um, for, for re researchers who are trying to figure out the history of the moon. And in fact, you may have seen headlines earlier this year that um, when NASA distributed those lunar samples to researchers around the country, they withheld quite a few and kept them sealed up. So they have not been um, exposed to, to the Earth's environment. They still are, are pure. Mm. From, from when they were first um, bagged and then put into airtight, um, what looked like metal briefcases up on the moon. So NASA is in fact on the 50th anniversary opening up another group of samples from the moon and distributing them to labs that have um, newer and better mm. analytical uh, instruments. So that 10 years can... from now, you'll be able to buy it on Amazon. I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> that may be true. Maybe eBay first, I don't know. But, um, no, not those, the new ones. Oh, the new ones. Really pure ones. That's what I meant. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Not the, not from, the ones from that newer missions. From newer missions, maybe private missions. Yeah. They will be brand new. They will be completely untouched from, from the South Pole, from yeah. the North Pole, anywhere. Well, and what you mentioned, I mean, that really is the driver for, um, you know, uh, guys like uh, Musk and Bezos in this drive to, to bring down the cost. 
of launching by you know, using reusable uh, vehicles and, and new, more innovative spacecraft design. If you can bring down the cost of a lunar mission, then you can really open up a whole new vistas for, for scientific research. Because you know, one thing that Apollo taught us is, yes, we can do it. We can land humans on the moon. We can do science on the moon. But it has a very hefty price tag. So if you can bring that price tag down, then you can get all of those benefits without the, the huge chunk of GDP that you have to, uh, to pull in. Matt, could I ask you to expand on that thought just a little bit that the, the, you know, the Apollo landing and the, and the Apollo landings rather, you know, represent our one example of humans doing science on another mm -hmm. heavenly body. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what do you see as the difference of humans doing science out there than these robotic missions? Could you talk sure. about the yeah, key well, difference? There's, there's a few differences that you could point out. For one thing, I mean, rovers are, are fantastic, and they've gotten a lot more sophisticated and more capable as time has gone on. But they still cover very short distances compared to what a human would if they were in the field. If you had a human being on Mars, they could cover quite, you know, probably the, a lot of what the rovers have already done in, in a matter of, of, of a week or so, right? It's, it's, it's not... I um, don't see that. In, no? in here, if I want to go far, I don't walk. I take a car. Yes. So it's, it, and if there's a car, you can go as far as you want. Yes. And the humans are so expensive, you have to bring them back. Mm -hmm. And you have yes. to, they have to go to the potty. You have to feed them oxygen carbon yeah. dioxide, all of those things. It's a terrible idea. Yes. <laughs> well. No, I mean, wait a minute, for science. Yeah. I think that for, to, to be there as an aspirational thing, I think it's wonderful. So don't, you know, don't take me too seriously. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you're right. I mean, I think we can, we can definitely argue about the actual value of the speed at which humans can work and the fact that humans can make real-time decisions about um, rocks or, or, or features that a rover can't make, um, you know, and we can say it, it's, not that, it. it's not that it's not that much of a problem that Mars exploration takes takes place at a slow pace hmm. with rovers. There's no reason that we need to know about Mars tomorrow or in the next year. Mm. Um, we don't need to answer all of those questions quickly. But if you wanted to answer them quickly your best bet would be sending humans, if you're willing to, to pay the price and if you're willing to take the risk. What do you, what do you think about these people who are volunteering for one-way trips to <laughs> Don't send them. I know I wouldn't do it. That's yeah. all I know. I don't know anyone who would, but they are apparently are I think it's a catch-22. If somebody volunteers, you shouldn't send him <laughs> or her. <laughs> Dan, I did, I did want to give a chance to you to talk about, if you, if you could, just um, you know, what it was like for you reacting to that Apollo 11 moon landing. What, you know, um, you know, what resonance did it have for you? What did you make of it? Well, <clears throat> we were pretty confident that, that it was going to go well, but there's so many unknowns. You really need, were unsure. And, we were so happy, you know, when, it, when we saw, like everyone else on television, in this gray that you could hardly see, but there were footsteps and people moving, or <clears throat> beginning to move around. And uh, actually, we talked to, uh, on Apollo 11, it was Neil and, uh, and uh, Buzz that walked on the moon. And we saw Michael Collins not too maybe mm -hmm. someplace in the last year, and Sue is with me, will say anything to anybody. And she said, Michael, how'd you feel getting left up there while your buddies were walking on the moon? No. I wouldn't have dared say it. And he said, just doing my job, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it struck me that the Apollo missions in, as a whole and especially the Apollo 11 landing itself, um, was an incredibly high visibility and high stakes test for digital computing itself. The entire world was watching a mission that critically relied on the computers working. What do you think is the importance of that Apollo experience um, to, 
the kind of the history of computing to people's perceptions of computing, its, its place in the popular imagination. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I'm not no. sure. I don't know how, what. That was such a special activity. Mm. I'm not sure that it moves over into what people's common use of computers for everything nowadays, from your watch to here. Right. I think there was a, a big step at Apollo, namely that computers, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Apollo was probably the first uh, vehicle where computers did everything. It's not only that, that you put in some numbers and then you get a trajectory back. No, you actually turn the valves to the, um, yes. the nozzles. And, and that direct control, it was probably the first uh, digital artifact uh, that, uh, that we have so many of now. When you look at, a, look at why an inkjet printer is so much simpler than a teletype. Have you ever seen a teletype inside? Yeah. Or even a typewriter. <laughs> look at an old fashioned typewriter, how complicated it is inside. Then look at an inkjet printer, how simple it is inside. That's because it's a digital artifact. It's the computer that has the complexity and all, all the machine has to do is, is, mm -hmm. is be an effector for the output of the computer. And I think Apollo was the first such digital artifact. And, oh. and for example, the, the, uh, the, your computer was later employed in fly-by-wire in mm -hmm. aircraft. Again, for the, for the, so the aircraft were probably the second where you started to move the, uh, the, the control surfaces uh, directly by the computer. And, and, and today, of course, it's, we think of nothing. I mean, when you, when you get into my car, the rear view mirror is controlled by the computer. And I know that because it does all kinds of stuff that <laughs> I didn't tell, didn't tell it to do. Mm -hmm. Some of them I don't like, but, that's, <laughs> but then I have, a, I have a panel. Well, can I disable it, maybe? Yeah. But anyway, so it's, it's, I think it was, a, it, it was a, a very significant change that is not, uh, not much appreciated mm. because the actual computational problem of in space is rather simple, as you so yeah. eloquently pointed out. Uh, uh, celestial motion being the simplest of the motions, and no wonder that Newton <laughs> created his theories in the celestial sphere, not on the dirty, mm. uh, in the dirt where there's friction and all kinds of stuff, <laughs> where Aristotle was, was thinking that the, the, the more you push something, the faster it goes. Uh -uh. So, well, it does in a, in, on Earth, in the mud, but not in, in, uh, in the abstract physics. So, so the computational need wasn't that great, but the I.O complexity and the complexity of the systems was, 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 was a way beyond of what was done before. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear if you have any thoughts on um, what developments, questions, or insights um, from the Apollo era software experience shaped the creation of software thereafter. Were there issues or um, issues or developments that occurred that became uh, very important thereafter. I'm thinking here in terms of things like the entire question about software engineering as a kind of a, a discipline and approach. Hmm. Does anybody have any, do you have any thoughts on that, Dan? I don't know that it really introduced much of the new thought on it. Uh, Apollo was thought of as a very specific where they were doing a particular job and they had astronauts that had a very limited interface. This, he showed me the little disky which you can just hit a couple of, you can't do very much with, but it has, has, it just has the digits zero to 10 and a couple of other verb noun and so forth. It's very, very primitive as to what it was, but it was quite reliable. It mm -hmm. was an important thing. And I don't know where we're headed down the reliability scale as far as certainly I, a lot of things I use nowadays for computers aren't very reliable. <laughs> <laughs> and they're always, it gives me unfathomable 
<laughs> messages of what's going on. And even when I pick up my phone, it's got some crazy <laughs> display I didn't ask for, and I don't know <laughs> why it even appeared there. So. I did want to ask, maybe uh, monopolize a little bit more of the panel's time before turning to the audience's question to ask um, you all to look ahead. Um, you know, as we look at the present and out into the future, is computing even more important to human activity in space than it once was um, for space and earth science? You know, where is the trend line heading and, and why? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Boy, that's hard. As a fellow said, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt? Well, based on sort of historical trends, I think they're becoming, um, computing and robotics are becoming more and more important in planetary exploration. And, you know, we were, we were talking before about how useful it is to have humans for exploration. I actually think that, you know, as we develop more and more smart computers and maybe even some form of artificial intelligence, that this may be the next leap forward in planetary exploration possibly not having humans there, but having human-like robots who are able to explore those environments. Hmm. That's maybe way in the future. Charles, any? <laughs> the disk. Oh, this is the disk. This was the interface to yes, the, that was the, the Apollo disky. computer. Pretty primitive. Yeah, this is a remake. Uh, and it's self-contained, and, the, and it, it emulates it, apparently. Somebody just told me that uh, the verb 35 was a lamp test. So, we're going to say verb. 35. Okay, That's correct. Turn it the right way. Yeah. Verb. <laughs> 35. Enter. Enter. Oops. There you <laughs> go. It worked. <laughs> cool. I also, uh, last question from me. Um, uses of computers that we take for granted today fundamentally rely on space services like the global positioning system for mapping. Yes. Um, how do you uh, see the connections between these space services and computing evolving? Does anyone have any thoughts on those connections? Not much. I don't. <laughs> Charles? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Nobody wants I'm that one. I've stumped you, so I'll do <laughs> Yeah. So perhaps Maybe we that, should turn to the, uh, the I audience. think indeed I will. <laughs> um, me, I have to say I forgot the question. <laughs> Let me just Sorry. toss out one thing yeah. while we were talking, completely off a different subject, but it reminds me when I was on the submarine. We keep talking about carbon dioxide trouble here, and it's, what is it, around now three parts per million or something like that, four? When I was on the submarine, it wasn't three parts per million, or five, or ten parts, or a hundred, or a thousand. It was 17,000 parts per million was the CO2 in the air we were breathing. Yeah. That, if my numbers are right, that's almost two yeah. percent. And people, there were guys who were complaining because it affected them. I mean, carbon dioxide normal levels are tiny little fraction, right, with parts per million. Are we going to be sending people on long trips where we can control mm. carbon dioxide? Uh, is there a way to do it? I don't know. But just from my experience, it, I realized that was a significant problem if you're going to spend a long time with people putting carbon dioxide in the air. Mm. There's a, the space station has a very good system of, That's of removing, the, removing the carbon dioxide that is regenerative. So it's Great. only using energy. And, uh, and it, uh, uh, it, it re recirculates its own uh, mm. uh, absorbing material. Wonderful. Yeah. 400 right now. Yeah. yeah. 400. 400. Yeah. I'm sure it's higher on the spacecraft, but yeah. yeah. Well, but let's I, I think it's a, it's a well understood problem. Yeah, 300 but to 400. The, the big problems for long term uh, space uh, occupation, if you will, uh, one of them is weightlessness. We don't really understand. Uh, what can be done in weightlessness mm -hmm. and radiation is the other one. So those are the big, big, big questions, yeah. dangers. There are some uh, questions from the audience that are variations on the theme of how did you assure that the software was bug-free? 
for the And I think that could apply both to, well, I think that's a question for you, Dan. They tried very hard. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is really bug free, but they kept trying and trying with as many different ways as you could. And some of them were just random acts of what would happen. I mean, there were times from the restart, I had a lot to do with the restart mechanism, which we weren't sure was going to be important, but even Apollo 11, it turned out, because of these program errors, they had restarted a number of times. And we worked hard to make sure that we were very careful about how we would make sure the state vector was always completely safe, that you, you planted one foot firmly before you left, picked up the other one. And you had to do a lot of uh, things to make sure that this worked all right as far as keeping everything going. But there's still people were worried how he did it, and they would just push buttons like to restart it or do something and then check out how it was going on. But it was just repetitive, doing this over and over, doing it. There should be smarter way. <laughs> uh, Charles, this is a question for you. Um, they ask, um, what are some of your favorite, you've mentioned your collection a couple times this evening, and this question is to ask you to name a few of your favorite Apollo items from your collection, if you can choose favorites among them. Mm. Yeah, I have a, a, a couple of, uh, uh, one of them is a, a flag that, that I got from the uh, uh, Armstrong family, and um, it's, um, it was probably on the surface of the moon, mm. And I'm saying probably because they, they, uh, they had three of them, and and they didn't sign or didn't uh, identify which one was which. Oh. To be fair to uh, mm -hmm. to Michael, so it's a, it's a two-third chance that it was on the surface of the moon. <laughs> but, but there is a and it's a wonderful uh, rep, I mean uh, relic, if you will. The uh, the uh, the other one is a a, a, a piece. Uh, a uh, checklist, uh, a page from the, from the checklist, which happens to be the first checklist after you land on the moon. And the first thing you do is put in two numbers, which are the parameters for the escape guidance, uh -huh. in, case, you know, in, in case something urgent mm. escape is necessary. So, and those are written into the, the, the um, uh, checklist, just like the, in the Russian checklist, there are many blanks that you, you write in by pencil. So that is this penciled in numbers by Buzz Aldrin. They're probably the first numbers ever written by humans on, a, in the, on the moon. So that's, that's great. I also have a page from the Gutenberg Bible. Ooh, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> One page. Matt, maybe we, we could ask a similar question of you. Are there some you know, uh, items from the National Air and Space Museum's collection in, this do in the domain that, you know, you're active in of, of planetary exploration that really sing for you, some, some favorites that stand out for you? Um, I mean, I have a lot of artifacts in, in the collection that I really uh, think are great. I mean, one of the things that we have on display in the Exploring the Planets gallery is the camera from the Surveyor 3 spacecraft which was cut off of that spacecraft by the Apollo 12 astronauts and brought back to Earth. So it was you know, human exploration meeting robotic exploration. And, and this camera is an evidence of, of that meeting. And um, so that's one of my favorite artifacts in there. But then we also have a really incredible spacecraft or piece of a spacecraft that is the return capsule from the Stardust mission, which went out and, and captured material from a comet, from the comet Vild 2 and then brought that material back to Earth. And we have that on display. And it's one of the few items in the planetary collection that, like that camera, has been to space and come back. Because with these robotic missions, we very rarely get anything back from them. They tend to just stay wherever we send them or continue flying off into uh, you know, the interstellar space like, uh, like Voyager has done. Right. Is my watch went to space and came back. Oh. <laughs> Very good. Did it lose any time? Yeah. Touche. 
This is actually a very, a, a quite an excellent question that is directed uh, to you, Dan, um, that really asks about um, the level of respect for the work on Apollo uh, over time. You know, has it been the case that um, there's been an increasing interest and appreciation for the Apollo work over time, or, or what has that been like uh, in terms of uh, recognition and appreciation for the work? Has it gone in cycles? I haven't seen it go in cycles. <laughs> it's, it seems to me there's been a very high appreciation. When anybody talks about it, they, they're almost reverent. They say, you did that, that's amazing. <laughs> so it's even 50 years, Later, there's still, although post, it's so long ago, it's hard for me to think about it. Most of the people in this room probably weren't even alive when a, a Apollo landed on the moon, but a few of us are old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is, a, this is another excellent question about the Apollo era that maybe we could invite if anyone has perspectives on it. Um, uh, the question about um, women contributing to the um, whole Apollo project and particularly in the computing area. Um, could we, you know, speak to the, the role of women? Sure. Uh, I can name you five or six that were on it that worked. They were fine. And uh, there were another five or six in the computer facility where our big machines were. But women were very common uh, in the 50s and 60s. And I tried to pinpoint why, but uh, it's not clear, but a lot of women were math majors. My sister is sitting here was, and as soon as she got out of college, she, IBM hired her and trained her. She didn't have any computer background. There were a lot of women math majors going way back, and a lot of them were hired to get on Frieden and Monroe calculators. And then somebody would hand them a Kraken's Fortran book and say, learn this, because I need somebody to help me. So they were there. They were ready. They were available and did it. Then the, the computer science departments began to open up in the late 60s. And for some reason, that turned down the number of women who were available. And to this day, the last thing I just read said 15% of the computer science students are female now. And this is, you know, 2019. It's a long, long time. But I don't know how to get more if they don't start earlier and, and uh, get them in high school and have more that, that want to follow. Yeah. But the computer science department don't have a good rep. I taught for a good while in it, and we had plenty, but there are a lot of people that, no thanks, I don't want. Huh. Yeah. One, one of the most visible women uh, that Dan worked with, I think, is this woman named Margaret Hamilton, who folks may have seen the image of her that circulates on Facebook every now and then, of her standing next to the code that she was responsible for. And the pile of code is about as tall as she is. Yes. Um, and you know, she is kind of known as one, one of the people who really um, you know, uh, was one of the major forces in, in that lab at MIT. And um, it's great that her story has been kind of rediscovered and put out there. And as we saw in the, in the case of um, the movie Hidden Figures, there are a lot of stories of people who worked in the um, early human spaceflight program who didn't sort of come to, into the light in those days, uh, either because they just um, you know, were women or minorities who weren't put into the limelight, or just because you know, they've been ignored by historians for years. And, and hopefully, that's being rectified now. A little late, but um, you know, better didn't, late than never, I guess. Didn't she get the Presidential Medal of Freedom? Recently, yes, yeah. Yes, indeed. And I think the, um, maybe a good question for us to end on from the audience, um, and I'd be interested to hear your opinions on it, about um, with the prospect of returning to the moon, um, you know, what most excites you um, about that prospect? 
Matt, any ideas? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm very excited by all of um, the proposals that are being put forward right now, and, and um, I'm, I'm excited to see how that will actually shape up and, and play out. And if we do go back to the moon with humans, what will it look like? When will it happen? Um, you know, we've, we've seen these programs uh, or, or proposals for these types of programs throughout the years, um, you know, uh, in, put forward by previous presidential administrations, um, and none of those have really come to fruition. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, especially now that we have so many more commercial players uh, who are, are throwing their hat in the ring, yeah. what happens next? I think that's the, probably the most exciting prospect about returning to uh, Moon, how much uh, private, uh, uh, private initiative there will yeah. be uh, and doing it in, in many different ways. I mean, when one listens to, to Jeff Bezos and, and, of course, Elon Musk, but, but Jeff is talking about a trillion people in space, a trillion people, just, uh, and he's not kidding. Hmm. Uh, and that, that's, of course, it's a factor of, what is it? It's a factor of 100. Hmm. <laughs> but think about our computing capability uh, has grown much more than that. And I certainly, if somebody had told me what computing will be like uh, 50 years from now, I wouldn't have believed what we have. In fact, I have an evidence. The, uh, if, you, if anybody reads, uh, 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 the uh, moon is a harsh mistress. Hmm. It's, it's a very old uh, science fiction, uh, well, from the, from exactly from the Apollo era. I took it to orbit, and I was reading it in orbit. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a particular segment there where there's a, you know, of course, there's an intelligent computer in it called Mike, but it doesn't matter. Mike, of course, has a lot of memory that an intelligent computer needs to have, and he, the protagonist asks for some private memory for his own use, mm. a human protagonist, right? and he gets seven megabytes. <laughs> so that's the biggest number that Heinlein could think of without, <laughs> without going into, into, into craziness, OK? Uh, which, which we can't, can't afford in science fiction. You have to be reasonable. <laughs> so, yeah. so think about that. Let, and, and, and so when I hear, um, uh, when I, and I remember uh, um, um, Alan Kay talking about, about the, the, the personal computer, or what is it, the dynamo, dynamo. right? Mm. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, the, I can't imagine that display. No way. A flat display color? You kidding? Impossible. <laughs> and, and I remember, I really do, thinking that it was impossible. And yet, it's, a, it's an everyday thing now. Let me when I listen to Bezos, and he's listening to, to, to uh, trillion people, I think it's impossible, okay. <laughs> and I'd be probably wrong. <laughs> Let me just say, you know, in the mid-60s or early 60s, we bought, I think it was our 360, might have been a megabyte of memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we think it's nothing. That cost us a million dollars. Because there was no, it was all separate cores and sprung yeah, out. There was right. no semiconductor memory. So it was a million dollars for a megabyte. Now. It's, what is it? Cents? <gasps> Millicents. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, please, everyone, won't you join me in thanking these gentlemen for these fascinating perspectives? Thank you very much.